This is part 5 of my lecture on correlation and regression where I'm going to be talking about regression. If we've got two variables, let's call them x and y, and they're correlated, and examples might be age and height, then for, even, then for any given value of x, we can estimate the expected value of y. This gives the mean value of y for that value of x. For example, if we're talking about age and height, it will be the average height of someone aged 12, for example. However, for any x, there's always a variation in y. It's not perfect, and so we can get the standard error of the estimate. That is the variation expressed by the standard deviation or the standard error of our estimated value of y for that x then the line joining all the mean y values for all x's is the regression line. Here's an example of uh, data plotting a y against x and we can see there is a general trend upward. If we did a correlation we would see that there is indeed a correlation uh, between y and x but we're interested in doing more than that. We're interested in predicting values. We can take any particular x value and look at the distribution of y for that x. And the blue curves here show the typical distribution, um, the probability distribution turned on its side, if you like, of y for any given x. And you can see that there is a spread, a standard deviation, about a mean value at every given value of x. And as x changes, the mean value changes. If we draw a line through the means, that is the regression line. It goes through the mean y at each x. So that is the definition of the regression line. But the regression line may be a straight line, it may be curved, in this case it's curved, but it's up to you to decide which is appropriate because the mathematics of the way you fit the line will depend whether you think it should be straight or it should be curved. If we're talking about linear regression, which is all I'm going to cover in this lecture, we assume that the regression line is straight. That's why we call it linear regression. And one way of thinking about this is to imagine a straight ruler that was tied to each of our measurement points uh, by a vertical elastic band. So imagine sticking a drawing pin at every point, attach an elastic band to that point and to the ruler, and let it pull the ruler to an equilibrium position. Now, the final position of that ruler is the one that minimizes the total energy of all the elastic bands. And the energy stored in a stretched elastic band is proportional to its length squared. So the final position of the ruler is the regression line, and it's the po position of the ruler where the sum of all the squared lengths of all the elastic bands is a minimum, because that's the one that minimizes the energy. That's why we call this a least squares fit. It's the one where the sum of all the squared lengths is smallest. The energy of the elastic bands is smallest. And we can see it illustrated here. Supposing these five points represent our measurements. Imagine sticking in a drawing pin at each of those points. The vertical lines represent uh, the elastic bands attached to the ruler, shown in blue. And the position of the ruler is the one that minimizes the squared lengths of all those elastic bands. Technically, those distances between the points and the best fit line are called the residuals. It's the distance that is left after we've done the fit. And the least squares fit is the one that minimizes the sum of all the squared residuals. So if we have a fit line with the equation y equals a plus bx, we can find the values of a and b by finding the line which minimizes the sum of the squares of those residuals and that's why it's called a least squares fit. If you go through the mathematics you'll find that the value of B 
is determined by Vxy, which is the covariance of x and y, divided by Vx, which is the variance of x. And then once you've determined b, it's easy to determine a, because if y equals a plus bx, and you've just determined b, you can then easily see that a must be my minus bmx, because the line has got to go through the mean point mx, my. A and B are known as the regression coefficients. They're the slope and intercept of that least, least squares fit line. So, mathematically, you can find the fit line by least squares if you calculate the variance of x and the covariance of x and y. And there are plenty of programs that will do this linear least squares fit for you. Sometimes we want to have a line that is constrained to go through the origin. If we know that our data has to go through x equals naught, y equals naught, then as well as letting our ruler bounce around on these elastic bands, we could imagine pivoting it at that fixed point, and we get a slightly different regression line. In this case, the equation of the fit line has got to be y equals bx, because it's got to go through the point x equals naught, y equals naught. Under these circumstances, we find that the value of b is given by the covariance vxy plus the x mean multiplied by the y mean divided by the x variance plus the x mean squared. So that's a um, the fit line that you get when a is fixed to be 0, b is the regression coefficient that is left. So we've got two different ways of doing a uh, straight line or linear least squares fit, one which is unconstrained and which we get a plus bx, and this one where we've constrained a to be zero to make it go through the origin. The fit with it constrained to go through the origin won't be as good as when a is allowed to vary, but if you know that your measurements have to go through x equals naught, y equals naught, it may be more physically relevant. There's also this question about which way round you have the, the data. Um, if you think about what I've just been showing you, I was minimizing the square of the y residual, the vertical distance between each point and the line. That's known as a regression of y on x. And it minimizes the square of the y residuals, which predicts the y value when x is known but we could turn the whole thing on its head and do a regression of x on y, which would minimize the squared x residuals, the horizontal lines on the right-hand chart. That would be useful for predicting x when y is known. And gen in general, the two regression lines are usually different. The regression of y on x gives a different line to the regression of x on y. And the one that you should use is the one appropriate to what prediction. Normally, we have the x values uh, precisely known and some uncertainty on the y. So normally, we're using the left-hand one, doing a regression of y on x. That allows us to predict y for a given x. But if you need to do it the other way around, you should do the opposite, a regression of x on y. We use x for the independent variable. That is, the thing on the horizontal axis is the one we know precisely. And y for the dependent variable, the thing that we want to predict from our measurements. We calculate the regression line by doing a regression of y on x. And that can be a linear regression or a curvilinear regression as appropriate for the data. Linear regression is uh, more straightforward curves are a bit more complicated, but there are programs that will do them for you. And you may want to fix the start of the curve at the defined value, for example, zero or some other measurement point that it's got to go through, if appropriate. Once you've done that, you can determine the regression coefficients. For example, for a linear regression, we've got y equals a plus b x with the regression coefficients a and b determined. And once you've determined that regression a equation,
you can use it to predict y for any given x. But if you determine a and b, you can put in x and it will predict what y is for you. So for example here, using a regression line with an equation y equals a plus bx, if we know x, we can look across to the line to predict the value of y. Since the line is not perfectly known because of the uncertainties in our measurement, even a known x with a perfect known value will project to an uncertainty in the y value due to the uncertainty of the regression line. So we get a mean value but with some spread about it. So if we want to know whether we've got a good fit or not, we can use the correlation coefficient but unfortunately that's not a sensitive measure of how good the fit is. For example, if you quote a correlation coefficient of 0 0.998, that's a pretty darn good correlation, but is it really better than one which is 0 0.995? Some people would quote that and say, yes, that shows that one is better than the other, but when it's as close as that, they're all really good, and it doesn't tell you anything about the agreement, as we've already seen. So using the correlation coefficient as a measure of goodness of fit is not a very good way of doing it. The regression coefficients will tell you about the agreement because if x and y are the same then we expect a equals naught, that is it, it, the intercept is zero, it goes through the origin, and b equals one, that is the slope is equal to one, is equal to the line of identity. Um, in fact, you can determine the standard deviation of A and B to test whether they are consistent with the expected values because if the 95% confidence interval for A doesn't include zero or the 95% confidence interval for B doesn't include one, then you know they are significantly different to what you would hope for. But the standard error of the Y estimate is a better way of telling you how good the fit is. This is defined as the standard deviation of the y values, not about the mean y, but about the fit of the line. So normally when we calculate a standard deviation, we have yi minus the mean y. Here we've got yi minus a minus bxi, remembering that a plus bx is the predicted value of the line at y. This is the difference of y from the line. That is the residual. So we square that, sum them up, and divide by n minus 2. Um, we're doing dividing by n minus 2 because in doing the fit we've already determined two parameters, a and b, and we've lost some degrees of freedom. And this gives what is called the standard error of the y estimate. It's like a variance, but it's the variance about the fit. Uh, in fact, the Excel function linest for linear estimate is uh, will give you a value for the standard error of the y. And that is a good way of saying whether you've got a good fit or not, rather than the correlation coefficient. Here's an example with some real data taken from a publication in Nuclear Medicine Communications by Iski Gordon where he's looking at kidney depth on the vertical axis against the body surface area of the child um, in square meters which can be calculated from height and weight. So if you like the horizontal axis is a measure of the child's size measured from their height and weight. And he's measured kidney depth for lots of children and that's shown for the left and right kidneys by the crosses and the circles and we've got a line through that determined by least squares which has the regression equation d equals 1.42 plus 2.82a where a is the surface area and d is the kidney depth. So the benefit of that is that if we know the height and weight of a child we can look up their surface area and read off from this graph what the estimated kidney depth should be. So that's an example of the use of the regression equation to predict a kidney depth for a given sized child.
So if you want to do this using Excel, you can create a scatter chart like this by putting the data into the graphing tool using a chart type called XY Scatter. You get something like that. If you then right click on the data and select Add Trend Line, it will allow you to plot a trend line and you can select either linear or logarithmic or polynomial. So linear is the usual one if you want just a straight trend line. And then on the options you can select display the equation on the chart and the display R squared on the chart. And then you'll get a trend line like that with the equation y equals 3.485x plus 31.97 square and the correlation coefficient r squared is 0.3557. If you want to get a proper value for the correlation coefficient r squared don't set the intercept, let it choose the proper intercept. If you choose to set the intercept to 0 then it will make sure you've got a line that goes through 0 y equals 5.342x in this case um, but r squared the correlation coefficient will now not be correct because you've not got a proper um, least squares line with the proper r squared so xl gives you the wrong r squared if you set the intercept to zero so in summary in this lecture we've talked about the correlation coefficient being used to demonstrate the strength of a relationship between two variables but unfortunately it doesn't say anything about agreement. We then talked about the Bland-Altman plot as being a much better way of showing whether there's agreement between two measurements of the same thing and then we've just looked at regression which allows you to predict one variable from another using least squares fit. And I finished by explaining that the standard error of the estimate tells you how good the fit is not the correlation coefficient. Don't use correlation coefficient as a measure of goodness of fit. So that's the end of my eighth lecture on statistics.